Good evening and welcome. You're watching the news track. I'm Rahul Kamal. In the power pack edition of the news track tonight, we'll be looking at the latest from the horrific rape and murder of a young doctor in Kolkata. The West Bengal Chief Minister hit the streets today. The governor is up in arms against her. We'll get you all the latest and more on the news track tonight. Rape and murder most foul ignites nationwide fury. National escalation over Kolkata horror. Lies, cover up and excuses. Politics over Abhaya explodes. आज वहाँ पर सीपीएम प्रतिबात कर रहे मंच बनाकर लेकिन हम लोग को करने नहीं दिए जा रहे और हम लोग ये भी बोले कि हम लोग अदालत के राय का अपेक्षा करेंगे फिर भी हम लोग को कार्यकर्ता को उठा के लेके गया ममता बैनर्जी सेज हैंग द रेपिस्ट बाय संडे फांसी वो दोषी है कि वो आगामी रविवार को सीबीआई के Politics derailing Kolkata crime probe. That's our top focus on the news track. Two big exclusives coming up on the news track tonight. I'll first be in conversation with Dr. C. V. Anand Bose, Governor of the State of West Bengal. West Bengal Chief Minister Mamta Banerjee hitting the streets today along with women leaders from the Trinamool. The governor though outraged by the inaction and the ineptitude of the West Bengal government will be speaking to Governor Bose on the news track. Also in the second part of the news track this evening, I'll be in exclusive conversation with Dr. Geeta Gopinath, Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, she's got good news for the Indian economy, says uh, economic growth is higher than expected. She's also talking about revival in consumer consumption, especially in rural areas. All that and more coming up at 8.30 p.m. tonight. Nearly 30 people have been arrested in the aftermath of the midnight mayhem that was unleashed on Thursday. The Kolkata Police Commissioner has admitted uh, that he and his team failed to assess the situation. Meanwhile, the CBI is now questioning the former principal of R.G. Kar Medical College, Sandeep Ghosh. Here's more. A rampage never seen before at Kolkata's R.G. Kaur Hospital. Two days after the midnight mob attack on the facility, the thugs behind this mayhem are being unmasked. Twenty arrests have been made so far. The Kolkata police have only released the names of three accused. But CBI. At this point of time, entire videography is available. Now, if there is, they want to have, to have certain clarification, etc., the video is also available. So there is absolutely uh, uh, no issue as far as transparency is concerned. I don't know what more procedure could have brought in further transparency. I am still not very sure. In this video of the midnight mayhem released by the Bengal CID, the mob is seen breaking police barricades, clashing with the cops to storm the hospital wing before unleashing a streak of vandalism. The Calcutta High Court missed no words in its criticism of the Mamata government and the state police over the rampage questioning why the police were not prepared for the mob. The court said it is not believable that the police had no intelligence on a gathering of 7,000 people, stating that it is better to transfer patients out and shut the hospital instead. The court also raised this hospital renovation, questioning why the hospital authorities were in a hurry to renovate an area near the crime scene. Now on the 14th itself, in the evening, the hospital authority started uh, demolishing a particular wall which is near the crime scene area. Now we express again, once again express our apprehension that the evidence is being destroyed at the instance of the state. The CBI will file a status report on this vandalism. While four doctors were grilled on what exactly happened the night of Abhaya's rape and murder. 
The agency also questioned the former principal of RG Kaur Hospital, Sandeep Ghosh. Meanwhile, the fallout of this rampage continues from the national capital. After the attack in the RG Kaur Hospital on Wednesday night, things have changed in the past 48 hours. The FODA called, you know, resumed its protest. The IMA announced that it is going to withdraw all OPD services from Saturday 6 a.m. Uh, till uh, the end of Sunday as well. That is still not coming to action. It is an act for the protection of healthcare workers. We want CPA to come into action. We want a written assurance on that. And we want justice for the victim. To Kerala and Andhra Pradesh. These are doctors of the Tiruvanthara Medical College and also the Sri Chitra Tirunal in Medical Institute and also the Regional Cancer Centre. These are resident doctors, UG, PG and Dental College. One of our demands is the Central Protection Act implementation. Second thing is that we want justice for the deceased. So we want the... Uh, we want the uh, fight for that to be fast and to find the culprits as the earliest. Doctors took to the streets in massive protest held across the country. The Juniors Doctors Network of the Indian Medical Association have called an indefinite strike now, which will impact patients and dent hospital emergency services, ward duties and on-call services. The heat is clearly mounting on the Mamata government. Bureau Report, India Today. Under fire, Chief Minister Mamta Banerjee and women leaders from the Trinamool marched on the streets of Kolkata today, demanding that the rapist be hanged by Sunday. But the Chief Minister's comments blaming BAM, that's the left, and Ram, which is the right, the BJP, uh, for vandalism at the RJ Carr Hospital has triggered a massive storm. Here's how the political war of words is playing out. Mamata Banerjee leading a protest for the Yatra in Kolkata. Under fire after the 31-year-old trainee doctor's rape and murder, she is demanding that the accused be hanged. Flanked by women MPs, the chief minister also chanted slogans alleging a conspiracy by the left and the BJP. Earlier in the day, the BGP stormed the streets of Kolkata on Friday seeking justice for Abhaya. The Saffron Party workers staged massive stir against the Mamata Banerjee government and vandalism at the RG Kaur Hospital in the early hours of August 15. The BGP alleged that the TMC is destroying evidence in the rape and murder case. The BJP wanted to create, you know, have a dhanna over here. You can still see Agnamitra Paul speaking to the cops over here. Uh, very, very dramatic scenes we had seen where the BJP, um, where the BJP workers wanted to, you know, sit on a dhanna over here. However, they were not given permission, and the police. Uh, and the police uh, Didi, Didi, The allegations were strongly refuted by the TMC. Bodily fluids are measured in milliliters, not in grams. This was the total weight of the internal viscera of the reproductive organs. It has nothing to do with any amount of bodily fluids found. Number two, that the place of occurrence, the crime scene was tampered with and there was some kind of construction going on there. Please understand the facts surrounding this. 
The crime scene, the PO, the place of occurrence was sealed off by the police immediately after the crime came to light. It is secured. Mamta ji ko abhi Ram aur Vam yaad aa raha hai. Har chiz mein Ram ko blame kar rahi hai. Abhi apni nakami chupane ke liye bhi Ram ji ke naam ka sahara le rahi hai. To unko Ram ji bhi chama karne wale nahi hai. The BJP and the opposition aren't the only ones attacking Mamata Banerjee. Her own netas are slamming the government's actions. After party MP Sukhendu Shekhar Ray, Shantanu Sen openly lambasted Sandeep Ghosh, the ex-principal of RG Kaur Medical College. This is the principle that has been so controversial. And for this situation, we have to be in this situation in this situation. तो हमको लग रहा है इसके बारे में सरकार को भी थोड़ा सोचना चाहिए। While politics escalates over the gruesome rape and murder, doctors across India are on the streets waiting for justice to be served. With Sneha Murdani and Suryagni Roy in Kolkata, Bureau Report, India Today. This is the second incident after Sandesh Khali where a crime against women, a woman has shocked the nation. Joining us now live from Kolkata is the governor of West Bengal, Dr. C.V. Ananda Bose. Dr. Bose, thank you very much for taking our time and joining us in this crusade for justice for Abhaya. I want to start by getting you to talk about what's been going through your head. Forget being governor, a senior political figure, a constitutional authority, just as a human being. A young trainee doctor raped in what was supposed to be the safe confines of a government hospital, which is her workspace, uh, which is where she should be as safe as possible in a city which is meant to be one of the safest cities for women in the country, just as a human being. Uh, what's been going through your head uh, the, over the past several days? Dr. Ananda Bose, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Dr. Bose, I want to start this conversation by getting you to talk about, you know, how you see this... Uh, brutal rape and murder of young Abhaya, a trainee doctor at a government hospital in Kolkata, in what is supposed to be one of the safest cities in the country for women. You know, what have you, forget being a constitutional authority or governor, just as a human being first, you know, what's been going through your head and your heart as you've been looking at the incidents over the past several days? I see the incident as gruesome, most unkindest cut of all, something which no civilized society can tolerate. This is not the first time here. He said about Sandesh Kali. After Sandesh Kali, there has been disrobing of a woman in public. There has been instances of public flogging, yes, and the kangaroo court taking decisions. Most unfortunate is that the police did not act. The police did not prevent it. The police did not take action even after the incident. Even after this incident, there were attempts to cover it up, to conceal, to destroy the evidence. And even after this, even after the intervention of the Honorable High Court, which ordered CBI inquiry, on 14th, a group of marauders rushed into the hospital, destroyed everything. When I went there after the incident, immediately after the incident in the early morning, the nurses told me with tears in their eyes, they said the goons who came at night, they shouted at the nurses and said, you will be disrobed. You will be raped in public. There is nobody to question. There is nobody to question. That is a fear which is gripping Bengal society now. A government which does not action, does not act when action is called for. What the people get is not action but an alibi for inaction. There is a growing feeling 
that these things are supported by the government. Whether it is right or wrong, that is a growing feeling which I got from the striking doctors, the nurses, when I visited the hospital. One of the biggest questions at this moment is who was responsible for the post-midnight violence at the RG Car Government College and uh, Medical Center. So there have been different kinds of charges. You did your own preliminary fact-finding, basis your ground uh, investigation. What can you tell our viewers? Who do you think were the miscreants who attacked this hospital, its staff, smashed its premises in the dead of the night? Do I share the apprehensions of the striking doctors and the nurses in the matter? As a governor, I should not venture into a conclusion to such matters which is under investigation. But there is a growing feeling that the police minister, the home minister of the state, who happens to be the chief minister, there is a growing feeling the police minister is playing Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And people know who is Mr. Hyde who is Mr. Jekyll. This ambivalence by a government which is supposed to take strong action in the matter, dilly dallying with the instance, that is what is very worrisome as far as the people are concerned. How do you look at the cover-up by the Kolkata police? Uh, we've been seeing the commissioner saying that this is a motivated campaign against uh, the West Bengal government. Do you think there's a reason for the commissioner to step down and for action to be taken against those officials from the Kolkata police who didn't do their job, who are part of what seems like a cover-up? I can only say this much. As a former civil servant, the police have failed. The Calcutta police have failed miserably, not once but many times. It is incumbent upon the head of the police to take appropriate decision or the authorities to make him see reason. I think the police failure cannot be attributed to the constables alone. The leader of the police force should own up the responsibility. It is said that an army led by a lion, army of sheep led by a lion, is much more effective than an army of lions led by a sheep. Here we have to decide whether this army of police is led by a sheep or a lion, that is for the public to decide. The public have already expressed their displeasure of the police. As governor, when I officially express my dis displeasure, as it is envisaged in the con Constitution, I have to do a lot of circumspection. I have made up my mind, but I do not want to disclose in the public domain right now. So there have been reports that there was a larger scam taking place at the RG Car Medical College and Hospital. Uh, that patients were being charged for admission, for services, that even though this was a government hospital, the principal was part of this scam. That's what the local doctors, the trainees have been alleging and telling us. Uh, he was, however, instead of being sacked immediately when this incident happened, he was sent to another plum posting, which he took on. Uh, what have you heard about the possibility of there being a larger malified activity going on at this government college and hospital? Have you heard about it? What can you tell us? I have received a lot of written complaints and oral complaints. Complaints made by delegation after delegation which met me in those lines. I can only say RG Car has become a school for scandal. The investigation is required into that. What we see appears to be, appears to be, tip of the iceberg. There is much more to it than meets the eye. No, so in these complaints that have been made to you, can you tell us what else has been alleged? What is it that you think needs to be probed? Because there must be a frank conversation. Ultimately, an investigation will throw up whatever comes out of it. But what are the charges? What do you think needs to be probed? What do you think might have been going on according to the allegations you've received about the RG Car Hospital? The youngsters feel that this is done in connivance with the police and the government. They feel adequate security is not given to them. They feel there is connivance between the authorities and the under underground in various malpractices that are going on there. Specific allegations 
I have brought to the notice of government for appropriate action. At this stage, I do not want to discuss it in public, but there are tremendous allegations made against the administration of the Ajikar Hospital and also government's complaints in what is happening there. The police first arrested one person and uh, said that, you know, okay, the case, we, 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 are, we are investigating everything else, but the main accused has been nabbed. Then questions were asked about the possibility of a gang rape. On the basis of the evidence that you've seen, the testimonies that you've heard and everyone you've spoken to, do you think the police is at fault for not initially probing the aspect, the angle of a gang rape? Is that likely in this case? Because the police seems to deny it. Since the court has already intervened in that and given its order and is supervising it, I do not want to comment on details of that, but the possibility of gang rape is very much there. You met the students. The students were very angry and naturally so. Women in Kolkata, West Bengal and even across the country very agitated about the lack of safety. As governor of the state of West Bengal, what's your message to them? Women are scandalized. Society is angered. Children are disappointed. They are agitated. What has happened is something which never has happened. This does not bring credit to anybody down the line. There is governmental failure, police complicity. Whatever should not be there is there. This is a serious issue, a square issue, squarely drawn, which has received national attention, national resentment. I am sure that the denouement will certainly be there. I just want to turn the lens for a bit and ask you, Governor, some questions from the other side as well, because, uh, you know, about you speaking personally, the government says that you are speaking like an agent of the center. So how do you want to respond to the Mamta Banerjee government and those in the Trinamool who say, here is a person who has an axe to grind appointed by the center to try and find some fault in our function and to try and trip us? I will dismiss it as stale, flat and unprofitable. They are also going to the extent of alleging that there are sexual harassment complaints against the governor's office himself and that somebody who is accused of sexual harassment ought not to be speaking about these kind of matters. How would you respond to all those who say that, Governor? Since it is total lie, cooked up by the Chief Minister Mamata Banerjee against the governor, I have challenged her and given a defamation case which is in the court. Since it is sub I do not want to comment on that. The West Bengal Chief Minister is now demanding that the rapist be hanged by Sunday, that the CBI complete the probe by Saturday. Now that's impractical given how uh, the legal system functions in India. What do you make of the Trinamool's Padyatra in Kolkata, all the women leaders of the Trinamool protesting, they're demanding uh, justice for Abhaya and they're saying that the CBI should ensure that the rapist is hanged by Sunday. That is the biggest joke I have heard recently. A chief minister saying, hang the person, then continue the trial. It sounds like the Roman emperor, you know, who was saying, I am the Roman emperor, they are above, above grammar. This statement of the chief minister, to hang him and then start the trial, appears to be like that. The chief minister is behaving as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. People know what is what. Governor, part of the responsibility of the governor is to guide, advise the chief minister and the government. What's your advice to Chief Minister Mamta Banerjee at this moment, particularly when it comes to the police commissioner? You asked for him to step aside, a probe to be ordered against him. Would you like the chief minister to order a probe and to ask for her police commissioner to step down? Because many people have been alleging that Vineet Goyal has been acting as his master's voice and speaking more like a politician rather than a police commissioner. I have already indicated my displeasure about the police hierarchy, top hierarchy in Calcutta. Number two, your question. About this particular incident, 
which happened in Ajikar the same day, I have given a lengthy letter to the Chief Minister suggesting the action to be taken and also demanding a report from her under Article 167 of the Constitution of India. In the last five years, there were 30 such requests, no reply was given, which is unconstitutional. I made it very clear that if this is not done, all steps under the Constitution will be taken. Then, for the first time in five years, she gave me a reply. In that reply, he said that she has initiated CBA inquiry, though it's a fact, CBA inquiry was ordered by the court. Nevertheless, it has been done. I always take it up with the Chief Minister, his suggestions and instructions as required about various issues in the state. In this state also, letters have been given. I'm waiting for the reply. There are those in the opposition who believe that law and order has completely broken down in West Bengal and that the circumstances require that there be President's rule uh, imposed in the state. Do you think the situation has reached a position where you need to recommend to the center that President's rule be imposed in West Bengal or not? As governor, I should not be speaking out in the public about the decisions recommended by the governor to the higher-ups. I can only say the Constitution of India is strong enough. It has inner, inner strength to take care of any exigencies. I am watching. My well-thought-out report will go to the government of India as and when it is required. Dr. Bush, your answer intrigues me. Cons, including the input given by the opposition. Your answer intrigues me. Are you suggesting that you believe in your reports which you are sending to the center that the time has come for you to recommend that President's rule be imposed in West Bengal? Is that what you are suggesting? I am not suggesting anything. I said I will give to the center an appropriate report in the appropriate manner taking into consideration all facts, factors around and also the mandate of the Constitution of India. Now that the CBI has taken over, you said that uh, raping, uh, you are saying that hanging the rapist by Sunday is impractical, it simply cannot be. What do you think needs to be done to ensure that justice is administered in this case and a stern message sent out uh, that such kind of brutality will completely be unacceptable? I rest reassured that since the matter is under the consideration of the Honorable High Court, justice will be done. You know, you went to the RG Car Hospital for an inspection. There are reports that there was an attempt made to try and enter the seminar room, which is where this brutal incident took place, so that the evidence could be destroyed over there. They went to the second floor and smashed things there, but they didn't come to the third floor. Is that your information as well, that these miscreants were deliberately trying uh, to, to destroy all the evidence in this case? What I saw is macabre. What I saw is murky. Beyond that, I don't want to make a comment in a case that is under investigation. Why did the police not act with greater force? You know, the police wasn't just sitting around. Uh, they saw these uh, people come in. Why was there no information available in advance that there may be this kind of a riotous mob that enters the hospital premises? Why was the ho police not better prepared? Why did they not push back harder? What can you tell us, Governor? In this particular case, I see definite failure by the police. People are now doubting who is the cop, who is the thief. If anybody apprehends connivance and complicity of the police, they cannot be questioned. I am not satisfied the tardy way in which the police have handled this case. Do you think the miscreants who attacked RG Car Hospital were goons from the Trinamool Congress? Is that your information, Governor? I do not want to politicize the issue right now. No, because the Trinamool says that these are CPIM youth wing activists who attacked the hospital because they wanted to show the government in bad light. That's the counter charge. What do you know? What can you tell our viewers, sir? These are political charges and counter charges. 
I do not want to enter into politics. I would like to remain apolitical. Okay, you've spoken directly. You've raised very serious questions, asked for action against the Kolkata Police Commissioner, asked also for Mamta Banerjee to introspect very deeply and see where a law and order in the state of West Bengal has currently gone wrong. Dr. C. V. Ananda Bose. Governor of the State of West Bengal for joining us on this broadcast live and exclusive from Kolkata. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time, sir. Hello and welcome. At a time of major global economic uncertainty, we are joined in the national capital by the first deputy managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Dr. Geeta Gopinath, who's on a visit to India. Thank you very much, Dr. Gopinath, for your time and for joining us for this interaction. The IMF has recently upped the growth forecast for India for this financial year from 6.8 to 7 percent. You seem to be more bullish at this moment than the Ministry of Finance itself. I, I want to understand what is it that you're seeing in the Indian economic story at this moment which has led you to increase the growth projection for this year. Right. Well, so firstly, uh, India's growth did much better than we expected the last fiscal year and that those carryover effects are affecting our forecast for this year. The other factor is we see private consumption recovering. Uh, last year, if you looked at private consumption growth, it was around 4%. We expect that to increase, driven by the recovery in rural consumption. We're already seeing that if you look at two-wheeler sales and if you look at you know, the so-called fast-moving consumer goods sales, you're seeing that coming back up. The better monsoons that have happened, we expect will generate better harvests. And because of that, with agricultural incomes going up, we should see a recovery in rural consumption. So those are the two factors behind our upgrade. And do you see this recovery in consumption? Because that's really been one of the biggest topics of conversation here, that consumption, especially in rural areas, hasn't been growing. Do you see this as being sustainable or just a short-term blip in recovery? Yeah. So last year, an important headwind was the weaker monsoons, the weaker crop output, and that hitting rural incomes, which we was one of the factors that affected consumption in the rural area. So we see that changing for this year. Now that said, of course, there is the need for more general structural reforms in the economy to bring about higher growth. We have medium-term growth for India at around 6.5%. Now at these numbers, India will remain one of the fastest growing, not the fastest growing G20 economy in terms of major economies of the world. For example, 7% growth rate for this year would contribute about 17% to global growth. So India is a bright spot in the global economy in terms of its growth rates. But in terms of bringing up overall private consumption and so on, we think some of these factors will play a role. But more generally, structural reforms, which you know, the Prime Minister put a lot of focus on in his Independence Day speech, is going to play So let's important. spend a moment on the structural reforms you think are most important at this time, because there is also a new political reality in India with this government not having a full majority for the growth numbers to rise from the 6.5% that you're projecting over a medium term, what structural reforms do you think the government needs to tackle first, given the uncertain political play out of those reforms when they've been attempted in the past? Right. So there is a whole spectrum of reforms that are needed. Some will take more time to show outcomes than others will. One of the, one of the general factors we see is important for, for example, for investment, private sector investment and corporate investment, is the business environment, the ease of doing business, the ability to handle regulations, and so on, the amount of red tape, that matters. For example, we, had, we did a study which looked at where foreign direct investment was going, and the two bright spots in, in India are Gujarat and Tamil Nadu, and both of them also rank high in terms of business climate. So there's a strong correlation over there. That in implementing that uh, countrywide would be very helpful. Labor reforms are important. So we have, India has the new labor codes. This question of implementation, uh, that is still an ongoing process. It will require regulation at the central level, but also incentivizing the state governments to uh, implement the labor codes. That's again, something that can be done in the near term. Public infrastructure investment, digital infrastructure investment, that's a lot's been done, but a lot more is still of course needed. And, and that's another area. Trade restrictions we think is important. I mean, this is actually a, a, a going to be a decade of opportunity for India. The world is looking to diversify. 
looking for other markets to sell to, but also, importantly, other markets to buy from. And India presents that opportunity. You see a huge amount of interest in India right now. So uh, you know, the only way you're going to get that is if you're also going to be seen as being trade-friendly, because that's usually the path to getting into global supply chains. So these are some of the near-term ones. The more longer-term reforms, of course, are education, skilling. That's going to take time. Land reforms, including clear land titles, agricultural sector reforms. You know, all of these will take time, but can't emphasize enough the importance of human capital and skilling. The skill mismatch is still very large in India. Changing that is going to be very important. You spoke of keeping trade tariffs low, uh, given that globally we're seeing a push back against globalization and countries putting up their own protectionist barriers. What do you make of the current set of schemes and policies like production in linked incentives that the government has to trying to bring manufacturing into India? The concern is whether that links India adequately with global supply chains. Do you think India is missing a trick over there? What would, you, what would your policy recommendations be? I think the government is right to focus on some of the important areas and the, you know, the, there's the production linked, linked incentives and the recent budget had employment linked incentives, which is another area that requires attention. But the question is, of course, is oh, you know, how, what kind of results it will deliver. We're seeing countries around the world now eager to use policies to stimulate certain sectors in their economy. If you go by history, since it's not the first time this has been tried, it's been tried in the past. If you go by history, you know, those things have tended to be fiscally quite costly and not necessarily terribly effective. So it's important to do the cost-benefit analysis. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be done, but do the cost-benefit analysis and see what the outcomes are. But more broadly, just stepping back, we are concerned about a general environment of trade protectionism that's developing in the world. Uh, and this is something that we are you know, cautioning against, just given what we know of how beneficial trade has been in terms of reducing poverty uh, in terms of maintaining growth rates and technology transfers and so on. Let's spend a moment on employment-linked incentives, which Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman introduced in this budget. Do you see ELIs as being an adequate uh, device or a, you know, as a positive step in trying to deal with the central issue of job creation? So, again, it's identifying the problem that really needs to be addressed in terms of creating more uh, employment and more jobs being created. It's still early to figure out what the impact of it is going to be, but you know the pieces of it concept looks uh, interesting, but we're going to have to wait and see. We think coupling that with these other reforms, for example, what I talked about in terms of implementing the new labor codes that are there, because that provides more have flexibility in the labor globally? market, that can help. Have employment-linked incentives, it's very specific to the country, and it depends upon how it's being used and where it's being implemented. So, uh, you know, there's no... Countries put very different policies in place. I don't know if there's an exact match to what's being put in India right now. Uh, but again, what we know in terms of job creation and, and employment is in addition to measures of this kind is to have just basic structural reforms, improving business climate, raising corporate private investment, uh, labor market flexibility, land reforms, and so on. Given the scale of job creation that's needed, so we crunch some numbers, and if you look at What's needed between now and 2030 is anywhere between, cumulatively, between 60 million and 148 million additional jobs. Right? That scale of job creation will require a wide, big push. And I know there's this big debate going on whether we should be manufacturing focused or services focused or high tech focused. Given the scale of job creation that's needed, it's going to require everything. So having the right business environment, right, right investment climate, the right kind of human capital, right kind of health of the workers, all of that is going to be critical. It's going to require a big bang on multiple fronts. Prime Minister Modi has been speaking again and again about his vision of trying to make India an advanced economy by 2047, what he calls Amrit Kal and his vision of a Viksit Bharat, a developed India. On the back of the policies that you're seeing at play and the growth trajectory that you're seeing in, in front of you on the horizon, do you think India is on path currently to be an advanced economy by 2047? So firstly, again, I just want to emphasize that India is doing extremely well in terms of its growth rate. At 7%, it is the fastest growing major economy in the world. And being able to keep that up, which is what we expect it will do, 6.5%, I mean, that is a, a large accomplishment. Now, 2047 is a very long ways 
out. I think we can look at some intermediate targets around the way, along the way. We expect by 2027, India could be the third largest uh, economy in the world based on our growth projections. 27, not 28 or 29. According based on our current projections, 2027 uh, is when we expect that that could, that could happen. But what happens all the way in another, you know, several, uh, several more years later, of course, that's, you know, that's a long run. Now, we have to keep in mind that most middle-income countries have not graduated into advanced economy status, the so-called middle-income trap, where that doesn't happen. Uh, but it takes, it's the countries that keep up with persistent structural reforms on multiple fronts and graduating not just from at some point where it is more of you know, using techniques that exist to moving to being more innovation-driven economies, making that transition happen too. It takes all of that to get to being an advanced economy. There are small exceptions like South Korea and Singapore that have accomplished that. India can certainly uh, you know, work towards that uh, goal, but it's going to require a huge movement on multiple fronts. One of the big challenges with India's economic growth is the specter of growing income inequality. The fact that the rich are getting richer, uh, the poor are getting poorer. How do you think the Indian state and the Indian government should really be trying to tackle that challenge? So firstly, I mean, growth in India has helped a very large spectrum of people in India. I mean, poverty rates over the last decade have come down by a whole lot. So it has lifted a large number of people uh, in the country. Now, there's, there's the question of the different levels of growth that you're seeing in their incomes, and frankly, better data would help in that front. We just, we've been looking at it. It's hard to pin a story over there. What we do see is unevenness. There are some parts doing better than the others. The higher income, urban, do better, rural, uh, doing uh, not, as, not as well. Uh, and so, you know, that is an area where certainly more attention can be given, and the government is doing that, and we saw that in the, in the budget uh, measures, too, that have been taken. But again, how do you bring that around? I think there is the, the same set of factors I explained to you before, which is in terms of the near term versus the longer term, right? In terms of the longer term, better human capital, better skill mis, uh, match with the kinds of jobs that are going to be created for the future. That's going to be absolutely critical. Raising productivity in agriculture so that the workers move out of agriculture into the newer sectors is going to be absolutely uh, important. So these kinds of broad-based reforms will be will be critical. One of the big concerns is the specter of India getting caught in the middle income trap, $8,000 per capita, and you're not able to rise your population above that. And the fact is that India has such a big population that it's also a highly likely scenario. Uh, how concerned are you about this possibility that, okay, you're talking about an advanced economy, but the very real fear is that you could just get stuck like a lot of other countries in the middle income trap? Right. Firstly, I think if India can keep up growth at 7 8% for the next decade, you know, let's set aside the question of whether that gets you to advanced economy status or not, but that itself would be a, a big accomplishment. So, you know, everything along the way matters as much as getting to an advanced economy status. If you can get to an upper middle income uh, country status, you know, along the way, of course, that would be fantastic. So, I'm, you know, I think we should, uh, I think it's great, we should absolutely aspire for 2047 and the target that's been set there. But along the way, it will be very impressive if India keeps its growth rate up. We don't see that in many countries around the world right now, where growth is slowing in many places. If you look at global growth as a whole, it is, it's, you know, our projections for the medium term is the weakest it's been in decades. And many countries who were hit with all the headwinds in the last few years didn't really recover that well. India has done well. So it, you know, I think one should take some, some strength from that. How are you looking at what's happening in Bangladesh at this moment? Bangladesh has, for a few years, been one of the bright economic spots in South Asia, or at least from the outside it seemed like that. And now suddenly there's massive political tumult. How do you think Bangladesh should navigate? How do you think Bangladesh's economy should navigate this tumultuous political transition? Yeah, so firstly, I want to recognize the you know, really terrible human suffering that's happened over there in terms of loss of lives. We're working very close with Bangladesh. As you know, we have a program with Bangladesh. We've been... We are in close contact with them. We are absolutely committed to working with the new government, the interim government first, uh, and then, of course, whoever comes to power. Assessing what the impact of all of this is going to be for the economy, it's a bit early. I don't have a number for you. you know, Bangladesh trades with India. 
there's likely to be some trade disruptions, but we, in terms of spillovers to India, we don't really see that as a uh, major factor. How concerned are you about the possibility of the United States, given the unemployment numbers that just came out, slipping into a recession? Our baseline is for, remains that the U.S. will have a soft landing. That is our baseline projection. You saw the re most recent retails data, retail sales data, which shows that there is still plenty of strength in U.S. consumption. We're seeing inflation coming back down. Uh, the Fed is clearly being data dependent, but you, you hear of talk of cutting of rates. So we're not in the recession. Uh, uh, we, don't, we don't see, you know, our, our baseline is for a soft landing and not for any recession. And finally, the big X factor in global growth is the potential outcome of the presidential race in the United States between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. How do you see that impact the U.S. economy and global growth? So, as you know, I will not talk about any political uh, elections or outcomes, but what we do see is election, when you have elections, which are good to have, is that you do have some uncertainty around what kinds of policies that will happen next, and you, that affects markets. You can see that in, in the volatility of markets in some cases. So, it is what it gives you right now is the uncertainty around it. Of course, when the election results are out, we'll know what the policies are. You're here for... Uh event at the Delhi School of Economics, which was your alma mater. Uh, how special a moment is this for you to come back, uh, you know, when, when the institute, India's most pedigreed economic institute, is celebrating a big moment, and as one of the S-star students, what does this mean to you personally outside of all the economic rhetorics? Oh, well, first of all, it's wonderful to be back, and, and especially to, this is a great moment for Delhi School of Economics, 75 years. It's my honor to have to be a part of their celebrations, and really, truly, I mean, that's where I learned my economics. It's where I am. It's what I'm using uh, for, for my job and for all the jobs that I've done so far. So I'm very thankful to the School of Economics and to India for that. Well, we wish you all the best. Thank you very much for your time. Have a great trip. Thank you. Thank you.